We are recording live. So welcome to Rich in Relationship. And just a heads up, I got a lot going on here today. I'm moving. So there may be a little background noise, maybe just a little. So here's what we're going to talk about today. And it's a super important topic. It's the elements of positive parenting in divorce, but really it could be in life. It could be in any situation. You know, this is what people in the divorce field called being child centric, but this is beyond child centric because let's face it, as parents, as we go down the pathway of life, we are often distracted from raising our children and we have trouble balancing our own needs with their needs. And so this is a guideline on how to do that. And particularly when you're under stress, it might be an element for positive parenting during the pandemic, which is so I hopefully winding down or at least transforming into something that's more bearable. So first let's talk about what is positive parenting. Positive parenting is when we are focused on the well-being of our children, on their development and their growth. And now that seems like, duh, right? Isn't everybody focused on the well-being and development of their children's growth? Yes, of course, that's always on the forefront of mind, but as human beings, we are super easily distracted. Like, like right now, uh, they're packing up my house to move. And it would be really easy for me to get stressed out about that and forget about the well-being of my children briefly. Uh, to the point where maybe I get them lunch late or maybe I'm not paying attention to them and they have too much screen time because I'm just so anxious about what's going on. So positive parenting is about balancing those elements. How do I keep my children on the front burner while there are major stressors in my life, like moving, like a pandemic, like a divorce? So when people are getting divorced, they generally feel like they're un under attack. When people are under stress, their amygdala is triggered, that part of their brain that's all about survival. Their amygdala is triggered and they're, they're thinking about fight or flight. All right, how do I protect myself? How do I fight what's in front of me? How do I make it through this stressful time without exploding? Uh, and when we're in that state, we can't possibly really think about our children in, the, in, in terms of their development and their growth because we're all about dealing with the immediate threat. And so positive parenting is where we are managing that amygdala. When we're faced with a stressor like the noise from the movers, that we remain focused on the job at hand. And by remaining focused on the job at hand, we are in a part of our brain that's rational. It's about staying rational no matter what. And some people might characterize this as resilience. Resilience is the ability to bounce back. So well, as we develop the ability to bounce back, as we develop the ability to notice when we're triggered, step back from it and focus on what's important, the basics being my kid is eating, my kid is resting, my kid is getting educated, my kid has playtime with other kids, my kid has time with me, my kid has time with the other parent, whether we're living together or not, my child... Um, is developing, like none of their talents are going to waste. If they have some musical ability, it continues to evolve and grow. If they have a speaking ability, they're in some way developing their speaking. If they have uh, math abilities, they're developing their math. If they have storytelling abilities, they're developing their stories. You know, this it would be positive parenting. So what would negative parenting be? Negative parenting obviously then would be when we allow ourselves to get distracted. Uh, negative parenting might occur if we're not taking care of ourselves. So part of positive parenting is gonna be modeling for our children what self-care looks like by eating well, by getting enough rest, by exercising, by developing our abilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now that doesn't mean that in positive parenting, we never sacrifice, we might sacrifice a little bit here for our children, a little bit there for our children, we're always going to make sure that our basic sense of well-being is being taken care of because we want to model that for them. And it's that thing of when you're on the airplane and the oxygen mask drops, who do they say to put it on first? Not your child, you, because you need to be oxygenated. If you put it on your child first and you pass out, how are they going to get off the plane, right? So part of positive parenting is maintaining our own sense of well-being and negative parenting can occur if we're not doing that if we're getting poor sleep 
we're going to be shorter tempered and more easily triggered. If we're hungry, we're going to be shorter tempered and easily triggered. If we're very upset about something like the movers, like the pandemic, like losing my job, like uh, the divorce. I mean, if uh, the behavior of the other person on the other side, if we get so angry with that person on the other side, that may interrupt our ability to parent. We might start saying to our child, you know, Tom, your dad, is a real jerk. I mean, I can't believe what he did. Let me tell you what he did. And the child is just like going, oh no, don't you not tell me about my dad. Don't talk about my dad that way, please. I love you both. I don't want to be in the middle. Or another thing what you might do in divorce if you're triggered is you might not speak directly to them, but you might be like on your phone with your friend and your child is over here and you might be saying, oh, Pam, I can't believe what she did this time. You know, she never has the kids to the house on time. She always keeps them extra. I, it's so and awful. And, you know, this time little Timmy was late for soccer. And, you know, it's not good for him to be late for soccer. Meanwhile, Timmy is sitting there again, cringing. Now, this is, these are unconscious things that we do that are negative parenting that come out of allowing ourselves to get unbalanced, allowing ourselves, not managing our own triggers. So we're not caring for ourselves and not managing our own triggers we can become very unbalanced at the expense of our children. Now, another form of negative parenting might be that someone might be very narcissistic, thinking only of themselves. And in those instances, they might be weaponizing the child. They might be saying, Timmy, remind your mom to have you here on time for soccer today, okay? It's super narcissistic, right? Like Timmy doesn't wanna be the messenger. It's not Timmy's fault. Timmy shouldn't be in the middle, but now I'm weaponizing him against the other parent. Um, that would definitely be a form of negative parenting. And if you're on the other side of that, if you're the mom who's married to that narcissistic guy who's weaponizing Timmy, how do you handle that? You know, and the way that you handle that is by saying to Timmy, hey, you know what? You shouldn't have to be the one to tell me this. Let me talk to your father directly about it. And you call up dad and say, hey, I understand that you have a concern in front of Timmy. You definitely want to say this. I understand you have a concern about drop off and pick up. Let's talk about it. You don't want to say, hey, do not use Timmy as a weapon because then you're doing that thing with Timmy that is not good for him. Like in front of Timmy, it's always, I understand you have a concern and I'm your partner and I want to help you. You may not feel that way, but you're always going to put that image forward. That would be the positive versus negative. All right. So we've got some clarity on positive and negative parenting here. Negative parenting, let's just go all the way with it, might be, Timmy says something you don't like and you scream and yell at him. Screaming and yelling could very easily be a form of negative parenting. Uh, you know, there's, there's like different stages of leadership. The lowest level is I'm the boss, I'm bigger than you, you do what I say. Uh, the highest one is I know what your interests are and I want to make sure your interests are met and mine. So let's be partners. And then there's everything in between that. So positive parenting is going to be more on the win-win side of parenting, more on the enrolling side. Uh, at, but there may be times when you need to say, all right, I know this is best for you, and I can see you're not sure, so we're going to move forward with this anyway, because I know this is best for you. And if, it's, if, if it turns out I'm wrong, we can talk about it afterwards, but why don't we just give this a shot, because I really have your best interests. You know, you want to avoid... I know you're going to be great at violin. You're going to play violin. There's no discussion. You want to avoid that kind of conversation. That would be on the negative scale. You want to stay on the positives as much as possible. All right. <clears throat> so what drives positive parenting? It isn't just about trigger control. It isn't just about making sure that you're taking care of yourself. It isn't just about not putting them in the middle. It isn't just about how to deal, though partially it is, with that person on the other side. What drives it is, are the values and principles that we hold highest. So a value and principle that we are gonna hold highest is what? Being a positive leader and role model in our child's life, no matter what. Whether there's moving going on, whether there's divorce going on, whether there's a pandemic going on, we're gonna demonstrate to them what it means to be a leader in our own lives. And as a leader, we're gonna to communicate to them our vision. So if Timmy is really good at violin and soccer uh, and not so good at spelling, 
we're going to say, you know, we, I'm going to do my best to help you be the best violin playing soccer player on the planet. And sad to say, you're going to need to work at this spelling thing anyway, even though you're not so good at it, because it's good for us to work on the things that are difficult for us. And we're going to demonstrate that by managing ourselves in uncomfortable circumstances and in other areas of our life. We always need to demonstrate the value or principle that we're teaching. Really important that we're living those values and principles as well. So how do you find your values and principles? Um, there's like reams of this stuff on my website, richinrelationship.com. There's a whole course on discovering values and principles, but there are ways that you can do it. I think there's a website called VIA where you can take a values assessment for free and they'll help you understand what your values are and how you prioritize them. In terms of principles and what's the distinction, the distinction between a value and a principle would be a principle is an idea and a value are things that we derive from that master idea. So um, a very commonly agreed upon value that isn't always acted upon, for example, is do, do unto others, right? Treat other people the way you want to be treated kind of thing. And values that you can pull out of that have to do with how you want to be treated. So I want to be treated with respect. I want to be treated with kindness. I want people to be tough with me when I'm uh, misguided. So like I, I want people to be respectful, but I want them to be firm with me if they think I'm moving in a direction that's poor for me. In fact, it's a very high requirement of my friends that they are willing to punch me right between the eyes if they think I'm going in the wrong direction and by agreement, vice versa. I don't mean literally punch, but I mean emotionally. They need to be willing to say, Rich, I've known you for years and this is not who you are. You really need to think about this, right? That's sort of like principle. These are values that have been driven out of this principle of do unto others as I would have them do unto me. So you want to identify some of these core principles and out of them, you're going to start pulling out the values for living. And the ways that you can do that are through groups that you spend time with. You can do that through uh, looking at your childhood, looking at your life. You can do that through just having a discussion with someone about what are the principles that are important to you. There's a million and one ways to explore that. And then you can spend some time deriving values out of that. And you also want to prioritize those values. So those are the things that are going to drive those really tough moments with your child where you want to make sure that Timmy, the violin playing soccer player, is learning how to spell Mississippi or whatever. You know, that's going to come out of these values. Like a value that I exemplified there was if there is there is there is value in pushing ourselves in our weak areas. And so the value is, it's even if we never learn, need to learn to spell Mississippi because we have spell check and we're not gonna write, and we love playing the violin while scoring a goal. Um, the actual act of pushing our mind to develop and grow in an area that it, it's soft in will expand us and grow us. So that's, that's a value that I, would, that I would be teaching through that. I don't know what someone else would be teaching through it. Okay, so once you have principles and values clear, what's next? You need to understand little Timmy's needs, of course, right? So we've already established that he likes soccer and violin playing. What else does he like? He likes playing with dolls. Why? We don't really know. Does it matter? It might, it might. we might be interested to know. We, what we find out is that Timmy um, has a whole fantasy world that he lives in with stories and the dolls help him to live it out. And, you know, what we see in that is that maybe Timmy has a future as a storyteller of some kind. Maybe he's going to be a public speaker. Maybe he's going to make movies. Maybe he's going to make animations. Maybe he's going to become a doll manufacturer because they live for him. We don't know, but we're going to support him in these areas of his interests and his growth because we don't want any talent to be wasted. We want every talent in our child to be evolved, all of their innate abilities to evolve and grow, particularly the ones that they're excited about, right? Because this is what life is about. It's about doing what we're excited about. Yeah, sometimes we need to learn how to spell Mississippi and put our nose to the grindstone. That shouldn't be our experience all day. That's just, that's a mind expansion exercise. In the bulk of our days, we need to be filled with things that we enjoy doing. So I enjoy talking about parenting and families. And so even though I'm in the middle of moving my home, here I am talking about 
families and parenting and, and values because actually it gives me joy in the midst of what could be very a stressful situation and no doubt maybe in some ways. So we wanna really understand our children's needs so that we can be there on their side so that they know we understand them and that we're always there for them, always backing them up. And once we understand their needs, then there's, the other thing we need to understand is the other parent. And why is that you ask? Because we need to know who the other major influencer is. And so if you happen to be in a very happy marriage where your values are aligned, that's gonna be relatively easy for you. Um, yeah, life is gonna change. You both have individual growth going on. Your values are gonna shift and change as the environment impacts you. But for the most part, you're gonna be walking together and your job then is just to remain in that walk together. If you're on the other end of the spectrum and you're divorcing and separating, it becomes really important to keep tabs on where the other parent is because you wanna know what are the principles that they're teaching little Timmy? How do they impact his values? If they're in some alignment with you, you may be co-parenting the other. Um, by some alignment, that means that you're willing to go to occasions together. You both share some concept of what Timmy's needs are. You have some agreement that you're not gonna have Timmy be in the middle either as a weapon or as a messenger or some of those other things that I talked about. But you may be in a situation where you're getting divorced from someone who is an extreme narcissist or has some other issue going on. And in those instances, you need to know even more what's going on there. And inevitably, no matter what your relationship is with the other parent, you are always teaching your child how to deal with what you perceive as the weaknesses of the other parent and of yourself, right? So a child is the conglomerate strengths and weaknesses of both parents. And we are gonna equip them to deal with the weaknesses as well as grow their strengths. And so what does that mean? Let's say the other parent is a pathological liar, but you feel it's super important for Timmy to have a relationship with the other parent. How do you meet that? First, you're gonna teach Timmy how to hear truth from lies. Next, you're gonna teach Timmy how to deal with those situations. For example, is it helpful for Timmy to go, Daddy, you are a pathological liar and I hate you. Probably not. So what you're going to do is you're going to teach Timmy that people who lie often don't want to be confronted and won't handle it well if you confront them. People who lie pathologically at least. And that you, that you have to give Timmy the tools he needs to deal with the fact that his dad is not always, in fact, rarely going to speak the truth to him. And you do that without talking about dad. That's the tricky part. It's about teaching Timmy how to deal with dishonesty. You teach him the principles of dealing with dishonesty. You teach him the principles of dealing with dishonesty if it happens to come from you, which it will happen. I mean, inevitably, we are all dishonest in some small way or big way. It's part of being human now. And we may correct ourselves, but other people may not. But we're gonna teach them how to manage that and in different circumstances. And then one day, Timmy's gonna come home and say, mom, dad lied to me and I did what you said. I've, I've kept it to myself, but I feel terrible. What should I do? And you're gonna walk Timmy through that, always speaking as well of dad as possible. It might look something like this. It might look like, you know, I know your dad has from time to time had difficulty being completely transparent or truthful. This is what human beings are like, but your dad really loves you and cares for you. And let's focus on his strengths. Uh, right, something like that. So this is like the hardest part is that once you understand the other parent, it's um, how to translate it in, into building your child up in the process. Now, if you have a really good marriage, the two of you can work that out together. If you're really far apart in the example I just gave you, then you're gonna be working one-to-one -one with the child. But inevitably, it's about translating your values and your principles so that Timmy can apply those values and principles in his life and have a, the healthiest possible relationship with you and the other parent and everyone else in his life. That is super positive parenting. And if you were in a tough divorce or had been in a tough divorce with someone like Timmy's dad, who's a narcissist and a pathological liar, that's gonna be a real challenge. You're definitely going to want help. I know um, 
I actually grew up in a situation not that different and the help was phenomenal. Timmy's gonna want help too, maybe not just from you, maybe from other people. Positive parenting is about considering all of your needs, their needs and how to move forward building resilience all the way through. So we talked a little bit about how this translates into an active marriage, the knowledge about Timmy, the knowledge about the other person and self-knowledge. Um, in an active marriage, it's going to be hopefully an ongoing discussion about how to, not like every day, but on a regular basis, staying in touch, making sure that you're on the same page, that you're touching the same values and principles, and that you have the same vision for Timmy and for each other. Uh, we've talked a little bit about how that translates into separation and divorce, depending on the level of distance between you and the other parent. That's going to involve, it might involve some touching on things together if you're in a co-parenting situation. You can actually use the same tools that you would in a marriage. If you're in a co-parent, but more in a business. It's less lovey and more business-like. All right, the project of our business is Timmy. We want Timmy to be successful. Let's see what we can agree on and what we can't. And where we disagree, let's negotiate and see if we can find a middle way that we both feel that works for Timmy. Or maybe we can try one approach and then the other and see what works best. Real business approach. But in a parallel parenting situation uh, where the other parent is just not on the same page as you. It's going to be all about you and Timmy and probably a whole lot of help. All right. In essence, that's what positive parenting is about in all these different situations. And get that. People change. Timmy changes as he grows up. You are changing as you meet the new challenges of life. Timmy's dad, let's call him Dave, Dave is changing. You know, Dave may be becoming less narcissistic. He may be getting worse. But what you need to sort of have your finger on the pulse. And to do it, it's a very tricky walk because you, on the one hand, you don't want to be judgmental because judgment leads to condemnation. Dave is such a narcissistic, pathological lying dog. I hate him, right? But at the same time, you have to have a picture of where Dave is at, a snapshot, a judgment in the moment that helps you decide how to navigate. So just get that every decision you make about the other parent is in the moment and be open to the fact that things are changing all the time. Could be positive, could be negative. So you need to keep reinventing, re-looking, reinvesting. All right, if, if you need any help with this, you can reach me at rich at richinrelationship.com. R-I-C-H at R-I-C-H I-N-R-E-L-A-T-I-O-N-S-H-I-P dot com. And if you are divorcing and you're looking for some affordable help, I'm starting, I have currently running uh, some divorce support groups called DEN groups, Divorce Education and Navigation Groups. They're online. They're very affordable. They're small and intimate. Um, and they're geogra geographically dispersed, meaning you're very unlikely to see anyone you know in them, and that's to maintain confidentiality. Uh, and eventually they will be uh, same sex groups and mixed sex groups, but right now they're mixed sex. So you can learn more about those at bit.ly forward slash den groups, D-E-N-G-R-O-U-P-S bit.ly forward slash den groups. So a den, it's like a den is, a, is our home, it's safe. The den is a, where, we, where we take care of our cubs and den stands for divorce, education and navigation. So check those out and looking forward to seeing you on the next episode of Rich in Relationships.